that you can be working on, you know, uh, something that you have already learned or learned to do it better, you know. Even if you can't make progress in the big things, you can make progress on the small things. And if you do that consistently enough, the big things will take care of themselves. This is what I found. Our intellects and our energy are very limited. We can only really focus on a very small part of a huge field like Krishna consciousness or devotional service. So we can't expect to you know, have the big, big realizations on a steady basis. That only happens every few years. So what we can do is that we can take a small area and polish that, and then another one, and then another one, and another one, until finally the whole thing comes clear. Can you give an example of like these small things that people can work on? Sanskrit pronunciation, looking up words in the dictionary, uh, analyzing uh, shlokas, memorizing shlokas, chanting your rounds nicely, cooking nicely, uh, doing the music and the songs nicely. Uh, all these little things make such a difference in the long run, you would be amazed. And how does one monitor his own progress? What is the metric that they're monitoring? Well, look at things through the eyes of the scripture. Uh, how well you're able to do that will tell you how far you're advanced. If you're reading through the scriptures and you go, what? <laughs> how is this possible? That means you're not looking through the eyes of the scriptures. If you're reading the scriptures and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, this is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're looking through the eyes of the scriptures. See? So I would say the more things that freak you out about the scriptures, the more things that you need to learn or the more areas you need to advance in. Uh, when you can read through the scriptures and just go, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, right, right, oh, cool. Wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> then you know you're making advancement. But the really big realizations happen once every five years, when 10 years, 30, 40 years, uh, the really, really big ones. And... Uh, you know, those are the ones that you never forget for the rest of your life. And they're worth waiting for. But if they don't happen, something's wrong. If you go 10 years without a major, major realization, practicing Krishna consciousness means something seriously wrong. You're making some offense or there's some mistake in your procedure or your understanding. So these, these major realizations, these certain milestones along the path, uh, can you give some examples of what they are like? like Brahmeti Paramatmeti Bhagavan Itti Shabhyate. They're, they're Brahman realization, Paramatma realization, and Bhagavan realization. These are the three major categories. And then in, in among those, there's many others. And then there's the famous Adao Shraddha Shloka from the uh, Nectar of Devotion by Rupa Goswami, that divides devotional service up into ten stages or categories. In the beginning, there's faith. Then one associates with devotees. Then he performs devotional service under the uh, initiation and representative of God in the form of the spiritual master. Then he attains uh, victory over all unwanted things. Uh, and then he gets steadiness, and then he gets taste, and then he gets ecstasy, and uh, so on. You see, all these things are there in sequence. So you have to know where you are in that sequence. That verse is very important. Adao Shraddha Sadhu Sangho. Look it up. Now, along this path, there is one big milestone, which is when we actually come face to face with Krishna. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And uh, how does that come about for you? Well, for me, I already told that story, at least on the website of how uh, I was working in Florida and basically I got laid off, <laughs> which was great because then I could collect unemployment. So I was saying, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to sit here in Florida? I was trying to preach and it wasn't going very well. So I said, no, maybe I'll do something completely different. And I just happened to know this lady 
in Kauai who had camped out. She said the first year that she was on Kauai, she camped out. So I said, oh, you must have had a great spot. She said, yeah. And she told me exactly how to find it. So I said, I know. I'll go to Kauai and camp out, and I'll just chant. I'll just chant the holy name. That's all I'm going to do. Because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done with trying to deal with my God brothers. I'm, I'm not making any headway in preaching. You know, I'm, I'm going to try this. And I had a lot of inspiration. So I packed up all my stuff, shipped out my, my vehicle and all my belongings out to Hawaii. This was right at the time of 9-11, by the way. Uh, I was stuck in L.A. for two weeks. I couldn't go. I had a ticket for 9-12 to go to Hawaii, and I couldn't go. Everything was shut down. So for two weeks, I hung out in L.A., and then I went out, and uh, I went to this campsite, set up my tent, and I lived there for more than six months. And that's all I did was chant. Every time I woke up, I would chant. And I would chant until I got hungry. And then I would eat. And I would chant some more. And then I'd take a walk, and I would chant on my walk. And maybe I'd take a little swim in the ocean or something like that. But most of the time, I just chanted. And if I woke up in the middle of the night, I would chant. Every time, that was my system. Every time I woke up, I would just chant. And I wound up chanting more than 64 rounds a day for a good long time, months straight. That was very good. That was the best thing I ever did for myself. But I wouldn't recommend that devotees do this until they have a firm grounding in the philosophy. Until they really know the philosophy the way I was talking about, huh? having studied it scrutinizingly and reached all the way to the top to Rasa Tattva. Because as I was chanting, I was meditating on Rasa Tattva. And we read this in the descriptions of the bhajan of all the great devotees, that they, they isolated themselves in a lonely place, they chanted the holy name, and they meditated on rasa tattva. I was, I was reading Ujjwala Nilamani, which most devotees have never even heard of. Uh, it's a very intimate description of uh, pastimes of Krishna and the gopis. Oh, it was just wonderful, just wonderful. And at the end, Krishna came. And did that just change everything dramatically, or <laughs> what was yes the and no. and before? Yes and no. It changed everything dramatically, but it took me a while to realize how it had. Huh? It's like, you know, Krishna could, could come in right now, huh? and reveal himself to us and disappear. And then what proof do you have that it ever happened? 